This bundle is a collection of fragments of individual associations bound together to have an objective collective collage of works and images of writer Inko Nierman and artist Trevor Parkman, Ayari Katsadar and Kojo Wishul. They are positive utopias, dreamscapes, dealing with optimistic aspects of saving the world and then. There are negative utopias, nightmares, considering pessimistically what happens if we do not succeed in keeping humanity on this planet alive. The worst case scenarios or doomsday arguments. To black an ecological consciousness might hurry up our urgency of getting out of the hungriest abyss of neoliberal life we live in. <laughs> in his term of epistemological anarchism, uh, Austrian-American philosopher of science Paul Weil Abend claims that because there is no fixed scientific method, it is best to have an anything goes attitude toward methodologies. And it is not possible to come up with an ambiguous way to distinguish science from religion, magic, or mythology. Synapses of mythical and mystical scientific and fictitious aspects, fantasies, and psychoanalytical approach should be intertwined together if we want to imagine any plasticity or future of hopefully non-hegemonical cosmologies. Hungarian-British polymath Michael Polanyi, the founder of Society for Freedom in Science, 1939, who has largely inspired Fire Abend, claims not to be devoted to any particular sect, but being rather eclectic by nature through an amplification of the Horace, who, in his glorious and fundamental epistle, declares that, being not obliged to swear allegiance to a master, Wherever the storm strikes me to, I turn in as a guest. It is an expression of the de determination of fellows to withstand the domination of authority and to verify all statements by an appeal to facts determined by experiment. Nullius in verba, on the word of no one, is the motto of Royal Society in London since 1660 as well. Polani argued that a structure of liberty is essential for the advancement of science that the subjective freedom to pursue science for its own sake is a prerequisite uh, for the production of knowledge through peer review and the scientific method, naming it spontaneous order, in other words, self-organization. He extended this into a general thesis on free societies. Polanyi defended a free society not on the negative grounds that we ought to respect private liberties, but on a positive ground that public liberties facilitate our pursuit of objective ideals. Polanyi advocated a post-criticality, calling it tacit knowledge, in which we recognize that we believe more than we can uh, prove and know more than we can say. Freedom, self-organization, is associated with forms of ocean colonization that are realized because of expected floods produced as a consequence of global warming, the expansion of life of the area, appetence for industrialization, industrialization of hidden natural sources, desire for alternative sovereignty, novel forms of self-governance, ontological, economical, political extension or detachment or exoticism, new recreational activities. Freedom, pluralist as we understand it, is romanticism, is ambivalent here as well. There are those dreamy idealists who search for autonomy, and there are various criminal minds who search for opportunities there too. International waters interest libertarians and neoliberals, oligarchs, from right and left anarchists to ultra-fascist naturists and other cosmocratic and smaller fans. In the water sector, emerging deficiencies of public systems and the budget crisis of governments resulted into increased water user participation. Understanding the apparently increasing smidgen of anarchy in the water sector includes the appreciation of complexity of governance developments, such as the introduction of participatory irrigation management transfer, uh, integrated water resource management, basin councils and multi-stakeholder platforms, as well as the limited role of non-governmental and grassroots organizations, considered the magic bullet in taking over and providing state services to the public. We conclude that the governance is anarchy by other means. As Kai Wagerich from Irrigation and Water Engineering Group declares, his colleague, Stefan Colombi, a paleontologist and an Egyptologist with an expert affiliation to ancient engineering, calls this, <coughs> calls this phenomena basin crisis. 
he describes future as hydrocentricity. Oceans are battlefields of freedoms for centuries. Pirates, buccaneers and colonizers, traffickers, slavers. As Emmanuel Levinas mentioned in his fabled Talmudic readings 1968, all that can ever be thought has been thought of already. Levinas actually interprets Goethe's proposal from 1790. There was a huge number of ideas of eschatological human outpost structures in the history, just like notorious ship Ark Noah, flying chariot of Ezekiel, <coughs> apocalyptic visions or, uh, of heaven in the Revelation or better hallucinations of St. John, or Hindu aerial car of God's Vimana, which relays both to explicit aeronautics as well to tacit mental channeling, correlation between the inner and outer. There is Nordic myth of floating continent of Asgard, and in the voyage number three, Jonathan Swift sends Gulliver to travel to Laputa, an island flying in the air. The city of Laputa is inhabited by ignorant, prideful scientists. Laputans are interested in uplifting ideas only. It makes them arrogantly supercilious, divided from the rest of the society in the most literal way possible. Swift's voyage number three, 1727, is considered as the very first form of science fiction writing because of highly advanced technical description of ma uh, magnetic levitation of Laputa <coughs> and reasonable predictions of orbits and periods of Mars, which was not discovered until 1877. Swift concentrates his satiric tractatus on people's pride in reason, which was in his era valued uh, above all other faculties, which is indicated by the name of this floating platform, Laputa. Laputa comes from Spanish and means whore. Swift was following Martin Luther's description of reason as a devil's pride, pretty street girl, greatest whore, 1546, who became infuriated with reason, the fetus of modern science, because some of his opponents were using it to deny his uh, emphasis on faith. Luther's affiliation is a perfect example of the dark wing of the Enlightenment, which through blackening the reason from the opposite perspective still addresses inclination of contemporary sciences for being the most hegemonic religion of all, scientism. In terms of future settlements, we have to think much further than free oceans will save us, unfortunately. The pioneering article, The Millennial Project Colonizing the Galaxy in Eight Easy Steps, by Marshall T. Savage, 1994, describes the darkest phenomena of the survival by the field of exploratory engineering and gives a series of concrete stages of civilization restart in interstellar colonization. In the line of many recent eschatologies and industries of fear, also Stephen Hawking warns that the natural resources vital to our survival are running out faster than we can replace them with sustainable alternatives. Hawking says, the long-term future of the human race must be in space. It will be difficult enough to avoid disaster on planet in the next hundred years. The human race shouldn't have all its eggs in one basket or on one planet. Let's hope we can avoid dropping the basket until we have spread the load. And here he goes more recently. Today, May 2016, Yuri Milner, Russian entrepreneur, and I launched a mission to the stars. Mark Zuckerberg, American entrepreneur, lent his support by joining the board of our new initiative, Breakthrough Starshot, which aims to develop a light sail nanocraft, a ground scale robotic space probe, and use a light beam to push it to 20% of the speed of light. A mission could reach Alpha Centauri about 20 years after launch and send back images of any planets discovered in a system. Einstein once imagined riding on a light beam and his thought experiment led him to the theory of special relativity. We have the chance to attain a significant fraction of that speed, 100 million miles an hour. Only by going that fast, we can reach the stars on the time scale of human life. Hawking does not call this tiny vehicle star ship, but star chip. By the way, he wants to reach the same star as Hitler and occult Thule Gesellschaft previously the Altdeutsche Gesellschaft für Metaphysik, plan to achieve with their real flying saucers. Alpha Centauri means the first bull's eye, and is the visual radix of the mystical letter sign symbol Aleph. Our fate on this planet is certain. The sun's slow expansion will, will cause the temperature at the surface of the Earth to rise. 
oceans will evaporate and the atmosphere will become laden with the water vapor, which like carbon dioxide is a very effective greenhouse gas. Oceans will boil, boil dry. In a billion years from now, the Earth will be an inhabitable ball, astrophysicist Robert Smith from University of Success claims. Contrarian John Tierney, following hypothesis of John Richard Gott III, is even more radical. He says, we need to get the colony up and running on Mars already in 46 years, in his A Survival Imperative for Space Colonization. So space colonization is a cata um, cataclysmic format for which numerous <coughs> lobbyists at the US Congress fight since the end of 1980s already, trying to establish the Space Settlement Act, the legislation of space colonization. The Space Settlement Institute, nonprofit association founded to promote the human colonization and settlement of outer space, believes that private industry, not government, must assume the lead in space settlement efforts. The Institute's mission includes an identification of financial and other incentives to motivate private industry to fulfill such a role, removal of regulatory, legal, and psychological barriers to private sector efforts in space. Their arguments rely on precedents of governmental donations of land to homesteaders in Northern America in 18th and 19th centuries. In the sense of exposure of private, we should retrofuturistically name these space settlers new privateers. <coughs> Deep Space Industries is an asteroid mining company developing the technologies to find, harvest, and supply the outer resources that will transform the space economy. The SI believe in an unlimited future, while Dmitry Itzkov, another Russian emerging technologies entrepreneur, speaks about infinite lifespan via his exclusive immortality project called 2045. Deep is down, the upper and bottomless uh, of waters and earths. Deep is up, the unimpressible infinity of cosmos. The alliance to rescue civilization aspires to establish a backup of human civilization facility to be built on the moon during NASA's plan to return there by 2024. NASA identifies space colonization as the ultimate goal of its uh, space flight program since 2005 already. This archive facility would, would ser serve to repopulate the Earth after any worldwide <coughs> disaster, preserving as much as possible of both the sciences and arts. Their project was described as Armageddon Insurance by Spiegel magazine. The Alliance to Rescue Civilization is linked to Lifeboat Foundation, the biggest online world-class think tank with a cognitive diversity of philosophers, economists, biologists, nanotechnologists, AI researchers, policy experts, lawyers, ethicists, futurists, neuroscientists, space experts to encourage scientific advancements while helping humanity survive existential risk and possible misuse of increasingly powerful technologies as we move towards the singularity. Lifeboat Foundation, their slogan is Safeguarding Humanity, divides the phenomena of catastrophe to four main categories. Calamities, collapses, dominiums, and betrayals. The only physical outer human outpost so far is the International Space Station, the largest artificial satellite in low Earth's orbit, launched into space in 1998. The ISS is not only the successful technological experiment, but also a sustainable example of transnational, suprapolitical society of the future metabiotic co cooperation of USA and Russia and others. Amongst objective dark ecological reasons, in terms of human outpost, phobias, panics, hysterias, conspiration theories, or depressive realisms, psychosocially rise out of something similar of what Peter Sloterdijk discusses in his Glorious Spheres trilogy, which consists of bubbles, microspherology, the discovery of self, globes, macrospherology, the exploration of world, foams, Plural spherology, the poetics of plurality. Sphere's trilogy deals with such spaces of coexistence which are commonly overlooked or taken for granted or forgotten. From these microspheres, ontological relations such as fetus, placenta, to macrospheres, macro uteri, such as nations or states, Sloterdijk analyzes environments where humans thrive but fail to dwell and traces a connection between vital crisis and crisis created when a sphere shatters. Crisis is like pain. 
It reminds us, our brain, on imminent, on, on imminent but in the meantime apparently so trivial presence over our whole body. Earth, nature, is our body. Estonian-American neuropsychobiologist Jak Panksepp proposed similar aspect in his hypothesis of separation distress years before Sloterdijk. The most cruel expulsion from the mother's womb, the most cruel impossibility of return back to the mother's womb, which humans try to recreate through science, ideology, and religion. Culture fights against nature. Mother turns to God. Greek Gaia, Latin Terra Mater, Mesoamerican Pachamama, or Pan-African amphibian goddess of vitality, Mamiwata. Oceanic, aquatic, hydrocentric, charter, or extraterritorial and extraterrestrial, or galactic settlement, or steading, or already real estate, planetary habitability, terraforming international space inhabited by interstellar society, are, are terms of the debate of the emerging colonization, similar to what transhumanism discusses around the human body. It is the discourse of colonies of phobes, and anti-regulatory colonies of files with colonies of progressives. <laughs> Words do not carry any aesthetical, ethical, or moral permanence. Words are not polarized on their own. Words many times receive and carry exerted meanings which obviously move to unhealthy prejudices. We should neutralize, purify, disinfect those exerted meanings, especially in the line of extreme acceleration of neocolonial expansion of human race. We should question contextual senses of words, especially freedom, liberty, anarchy, again and again. First, having read the book of myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I am having to do this not like Cousteau with his assiduous team abroad the sun-flooded schooner, but here alone. There is a ladder. The ladder is always there, hanging innocently, close to the side of the schooner, we know what it is for, we who have used it. <laughs> Otherwise, it is a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. I go down rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me. The blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down, my flippers cripple me. I crawl like an insect down a ladder. First, the air is blue, and then it is bluer, and then green, and then black. I am blacking out, and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. And now, it is easy to forget what I came for. Among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenulated fans beneath the reefs, and besides, you, you breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck the words are purposes, the words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed. The thing I came for, the wreck, and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself and not the myth, the drowned face always staring toward the sun, the evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty, the ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative 
haunt us. This is the place, and I am here, the mermaid, whose dark hair streams black, the merman in his armoured body. We circle silently about the wreck. We dive into the hold. I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes whose breasts still bear the stress, whose silver, copper, vermeil cargo lies obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. We are the half destroyed instruments that once held to a course, the water eaten log, the fouled compass. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths in which our names do not appear. What I like about um, this poem by Adrian Rich um, is three things. And uh, those three things um, speak to uh, this occasion that we're um, gathered in. Um, the first is the figure of the narrator as a, as a figure who <coughs> navigates a space of reason. So you know, as, you, as, I, as I listened to you reading the Adrian Rich, what I heard was um, the, the kinds of um, the technologies and the tools that the narrator gathers around her as she embarks on her quest to the bottom of the sea. So uh, she has to prepare her life support system. Um, she has to gather her tools. She has to gather her books. She has to gather her mask. Um, she has to turn herself into an apparatus that can survive a hostile uh, world. Um, but she has to learn all of this alone. And um, something about the way Adrian Rich narrates this poem, um, I think speaks to a condition in which the question of uh, the rising ocean, the condition of uh, French Polynesia, the condition of the seabed confronts everybody who is not a geologist, everybody who is not a biologist, or a scientist, or a lawyer. They confront them with, uh, with um, a kind of uh, an encounter by which you are called upon to both um, to take a kind of topological journey that extends your capacities. So one has to go beyond one's skills, one has to go beyond one's training, one has to go beyond one's knowledge. Um, so one has to confront one's ignorance. And this ignorance is figured by, by the darkness. It's as if the, the internal limit that you confront is doubled and extended to infinity by the darkness of the ocean. Um, and partly what's so moving about um, the Adrian Rich poem is that she says she has to turn my body without force. So it's as if she's learning a kind of grace under pressure. So she's learning how to inhabit a changed condition. She's learning how to inhabit uh, conditions of pressure um, conditions that are inhospitable to humanity, conditions that are indifferent to the human, um, and conditions that um, ignore intentionality. So she's, con she's confronting all of these and she's learning to, to, to understand them in terms of talk, in terms of torsion, in terms of movement. So she's learning a kind of new bodily language at the same time as she already has a kind of technological and rational language. And then further down, she undergoes a sea change. She says, I am he, 
I am she. We are the half-destroyed instruments. And this moment in which gender seems to double, whether it doubles or whether it splits, whether it multiplies, this moment seems to be a kind of ambiguous moment in the, in the poem where gender starts to engender a condition. So I would say this is maybe the third moment in the, in the poem. The first moment would be the, the space of navigation. Um, the second moment would be this confrontation with the limit, which speaks to Chusa's moment about having, Chusa's point yesterday, like, having to confront a question, having to confront and even cultivate a certain kind of ignorance. An ignorance which is not distinct from a certain kind of um, darkness uh, and a certain kind of movement in darkness and a certain kind of body language that moves in and through darkness. And then the third point is this moment of engendering, this moment when she says, we are, I am, you are, which evokes a similar poem written a bit later by the text. Be in this environment with so many colleagues and people I know and new people and, and it's extraordinary to have a forum like this where um, artists are together with scientists and it seems like a really truly interdisciplinary group and we're getting just an incredible amount of really productive work done and as I've said to a couple of other people it's like this is always something like a forum that I've kind of fantasized could exist and it's been amazing over the last couple of days to see like wow this this is really happening. So it's just, I just want to put that out there before going into the talk. Um, just thank you. Thank you for creating this. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk uh, about some projects that I've been doing, but then I'll also will kind of turn into a pro proposal of sorts for us kind of outline for a sketch of further research projects. But what I want to talk about are kind of two things in relation to the ocean, in relation to the seas. Um, the first thing that I want to present as an idea is the idea of a kind of vertical geography. Um, vertical geographies and alien topologies. And I guess um, that will become clear what I mean by that. But I think that we're conditioned uh, to think about societies as kind of existing on a horizontal axis, but they also exist on vertical axes, going from the bottom of the ocean, of course, up into the heavens and the stars in the forms of uh, spacecraft and various things in orbit around the Earth. And those are topologies of the ocean and of the air and of space are very, very different than uh, what we're kind of accustomed to in, in our everyday lives. We'll throw that out as an idea. And the second idea that I want to throw out there has to do with the weaponization of the ocean. And that's something I'm going to go into a little bit as well. Um, I want to begin with this image. This is an image of what we might think of as a kind of beginning of these vertical geographies. And this is the beginning of also the modern telecommunications systems as we know it when two ships met in the mid 19th century. The, um, the uh, USS Niagara and the HMS Agamemnon. And what they were doing was, of course, laying the first telegraph cable from the United States to Great Britain. It didn't work, but, you know, they got, they, they figured it out after a couple of years how to do it. And this was a um, flyer, a kind of poster commemorating it. And, you know, it's the, the US and the British coming together, and the idea is that there won't be war between the US and the British anymore because now we have this cable, we can talk to each other. I'm kind of showing that this Silicon Valley ideology of communications and a kind of global community or whatever going back um, much further than a lot of people imagine it going. Um, these underwater geographies of cables kind of became widespread by the turn of the um, 19th to 20th century. You know, we had many um, telegraph cables laid throughout the oceans. Um, but they were actually pretty inefficient. They didn't work very well. They were very expensive. Um, and when, the, uh, when people developed space flight, um, the world's telecommunications infrastructures migrated into outer space in the 1960s to another kind of 
topology, um, the topology of orbits, spacecraft, um, kind of transforming the heavens into a part of human infrastructures as well. Um, we kind of migrated back down to Earth with the development of fiber optic cables in the 1970s and 1980s, which made uh, cables practical again for global telecommunication. Um, they're very high bandwidth and uh, relatively inexpensive, especially compared to space. And so what started happening in the 1990s, in particular in the 2000s, is that the humans started wrapping the Earth in optical fiber. And in, Neil Stevenson put it actually in a beautiful way in the mid-1990s. He wrote an essay for Wired called Mother Earth Motherboard. He was talking about how, the, how we were transforming the surface of the planet into a giant motherboard, as he called it. Um, sitting here today, 99% of the world's uh, communications go through underseas cables and um, Satellites only account for about 1% of global telecommunications at this point. So we've re-gone back into the seas in terms of global telecommunications apparatuses. This has also marked the, the kind of laying of this new generation of cables has also marked what the National Security Agency calls the golden age of surveillance and um, has an, enabled them to, in the words of Keith Alexander, the former director of the NSA, to collect it all, all the time. So <clears throat> basically what he means is that the, the laying of these cables has created a situation where states, in particular the United States, are able to, for the first time in history, deploy what they call strategic surveillance, which is literally they can look at all communications pretty much all the time throughout the globe. And this is a map, this is one of the um, documents from the Snowden archive that kind of shows how they do that. Um, and undersea cables are a very crucial part of this. There's of course domestic um, infrastructures associated with this. Uh, Fairview is a program that is a collaboration between NSA and AT&T. Um, but you see those dots on the coasts of the US with those lines coming out of them. Those are landing sites, those are places where transoceanic cables um, come to land. This is some notes that I had. I was trying to figure out how this whole infrastructure worked. Um, these are the names of undersea cables. Um, the cables SMW3, that's called CMEWA3. It's a cable that connects Asia to Europe. Relationship Remedy, that's um, British Telecom. They collaborate with to tap that cable. There's another cable called Apollo. Um, connects the US to Europe. There's many, many of these cables. Um, but when you, when you look at a map like this, what, one of the things that you see, this is, on one hand, this is a map showing how global strategic surveillance works, but it's also a map that shows some of the specificities of how that works. And when you look at a map like this, you see that the, are you okay? It's just some water just dripped like the water. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You see that these cables are not evenly distributed around the world. And there's two things that you notice right away. One is that um, there's these blue dots, and these are what the NSA internally calls choke points. They're places where um, cables come on shore, and they, they come on shore in very specific places in the world. They come together as clusters. So the idea is if you can tap these places, this interface between the ocean and the land, you can get an enormous amount of information. And the second thing that you notice is that a huge amount of the world's telecommunications goes through the United States, whether or not you're communicating with somebody in the United States or not. I mean, it's quite literally true that if you send an email from Berlin to uh, Moscow, there's a very high chance that that email will go through the United States. So the, nor the US has a, an enormous kind of strategic advantage in terms of uh, because so much um, of the global communications infrastructure is located within the United States. So one project that I've been doing is going to these choke points, these places where there is this conjunction of cables and, where the, and places where the NSA is very interested in deploying uh, sensors and other surveillance equipment so that they can see most of the internet. And these places don't look like anything at all. This is one, for example, in Long Island. And the kind of rules of the image is that within the photograph has to be this conjunction of cables, but the cables would be underwater and under the beach in this 
uh, in this case. So you don't, there's actually no visible evidence whatsoever of what's going on from the photograph itself. Um, so these have been, I've coupled these with different kinds of collages that are all documents speaking to what's going on in the image, although what is, you know, what I'm interested in the image is, is not readily apparent. But for me, this is kind of a way of developing a different kind of vocabulary to think about what surveillance looks like or what a landscape looks like. These are all places that are hugely important to how state power is wielded around the world, and yet there's literally no trace of it whatsoever in the image. Um, so I started, I was photographing these seascapes, these places that I knew were hugely important places to how global mass surveillance works, but I was also studying these. These are nautical charts designed for ship captains um, and cables kind of inhabit this gray zone in terms of public information about them. On one hand, they don't really want to publicize where the cables are because they don't want people going and messing with them. On the other hand, they don't want ship captains dropping anchors on them and pulling them up. And so when you look at nautical charts, they often indicate where undersea cables are. And you can correlate those charts with this NSA document, which is called the Cable Master List, which is a list of all the cables in the world that they have taps on. And by putting all of this together, I kind of theorized that if you learned how to scuba dive and you studied the um, kind of topology of the ocean floor, that you might be able to find places where you could actually see this um, motherboard, this uh, connections of these conjunctions of internet cables on the seafloor. And so I started running around the world and hiring ships and little boats and mostly hiring uh, Navy divers to do this with me and, and kind of doing explorations on the ocean floor of places where I thought that you should be able to find um, global telecommunication systems. And it turned out in many cases that you can. This is a cable called BIX-1 that connects the US to the Bahamas. This is one called a Columbus 3, which connects the East Coast to Lisbon and the rest of Europe. It's one called Americas 2, connects the United States to Brazil and to the Caribbean. This is a huge conjunction of, of cables off the coast of um, Hawaii. I think we counted like 24 cables or something like down, down this, in this area. Uh, Hawaii, Guam, many places. I, I actually organized um, some dives where I take a group of people and instead of going and looking at sharks or manta rays, we'd go and look at the internet and <laughs> global surveillance. <laughs> um, so when you start looking at this, the seafloor and the sea, you get very unfamiliar topologies. And that simply has to do with the, the, the fact that the shape of underwater is totally different than the shape on land. Um, and a lot of analogies over the last few days have been made between um, the kind of underwater world and outer space, and I don't think that those are totally inaccurate. Um, as far as the military is concerned, there is... Hello? Hello? This one working? I think it's the NSA. No one was working. The second one was working. This one? No, no, it's because of transmission via plastic, actually. Plastic is better. Well, we could take the plastic off. I mean, it's not right. This is what he's doing. Technology enacting resistance. All right, well, I'll just speak loud. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So this underwater topology is totally different. Um, this is something that the military understands. They understand this for outer space, and they understand this for the ocean as well. And so there's a you kind of, they develop strategies for dealing with these kind of unearthly topologies, right? They figure out ways to be able to project power on both the horizontal, horizontal and vertical axes and in an environment where territory doesn't work in the same way that it does on land, right? Part of this um, underwater landscape, as far as the military is concerned, has to do with a kind of politics of visibility. In other words, they're able to leverage 
visibility and invisibility as a way to project power through this environment. Again, they do the same thing on space, and uh, they're able to leverage that invisibility. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is actually, there's a classified um, agency in the United States called the National Underwater Reconnaissance Office, which is what they call a, a black agency, meaning the very existence of this agency is top secret. This patch is not from that. This is actually from a, uh, from a spy satellite, but there are no images of this underwater reconnaissance office because it's a black agency, so I use this one instead. Um, but this National Underwater Reconnaissance Office has three main missions. The first mission is undersea mapping, right? So they do a huge amount of undersea mapping. Those maps are highly classified in the same way that old Portuguese maps were some of the state's greatest secrets. The second thing that they do is recover things from the ocean floor. And the third thing that they do is to tap undersea cables and conduct global surveillance underseas. And it does this with a fleet of specialized submarines, kind of historically. Historically, one of these was called the NR-1. And this is, it had this funny name, NR-1, because it was never officially christened. Um, and the, the reason why it was never officially christened is because the former director of the uh, National Underwater Reconnaissance Office, which was Admiral Hyman Rickover, he wanted to have basically a submarine that was off the books, you know, that Congress basically didn't know about. There's other submarines that have historically done this work. Um, the USS Parsh was one of them. The second one was the USS Halibut. The most recent kind of workhorse of the Underwater Reconnaissance Office is this submarine here, which is called the USS Jimmy Carter, <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which was launched in 2004. And one of the things that J the USS Jimmy Carter is designed to do is to be able to land on the ocean floor and place taps on undersea cables. Now, of course, the Russians have their own counterparts to this. One of their workhorses is the RSF Forty Kirillov, which, uh, which is a Russian equivalent. And this operates under the guise of being a salvage ship. Now, the kind of technology that you use to do undersea salvaging are exactly the same kind of things that you want to do to, under, to do undersea um, reconnaissance and tapping. Another Russian ship is here, the Nikoli Chikar. And a third one which was, uh, that was deployed last year in 2015 is called the RV Yantar, which uh, operates under the guise of being a research vessel. Now some of these um, ships you can actually track. Um, you can get trans transponder data from them. So, and that data can be very spotty because oftentimes they turn off the transponders. And, but this is some transponder data from looking at uh, Russian, the, these Russian ships that are involved in underwater reconnaissance. And what I'm kind of showing you with these ships and with this idea of the National Underwater Reconnaissance Office isn't so much a project so much as a sketch for the direction that a project might go in, a kind of avenue of research. And I'm kind of imagining that there would be, that one could do a project about undersea military geographies. And the idea would be to try to begin developing a kind of visual and conceptual framework for trying to learn how to see the strategic landscape of the underwater environment and kind of try to get a glimpse into the weaponization of the ocean. And I don't really think anybody's really done that. Um, so I have a couple proposals perhaps for the ship that you guys have. One is um, I can imagine using the ship to do civilian operations of um, military exercises. I think that would be a very worthwhile and kind of interesting thing to do. The other thing I can imagine doing is an expedition to Diego Garcia, which is an island in the Indian Ocean that you actually can't go to. <laughs> they won't let you land there, but whereas it, where it's a hugely important place from which the U.S. Uh, projects military activities. Um, I kind of want to sum up by saying that there are wars happening between, underneath the surface of the ocean. There are wars that are largely invisible to us and that are taking place in a topological space that's alien to our everyday experience. And while these wars are perhaps not visible to us or even visible to the animals that, the li that live below the sea, these wars are certainly audible to the life forms that live under seas. Um, I spent a lot of time diving in Hawaii in, in, in 
January looking for these undersea cables, kind of perhaps ironically with guys whose day jobs was working for the NSA. Um, but there was a moment which, which was actually one of the most incredible experiences that I've had diving. We were down, we were looking at a series of cables, and the guy I was working with turned to me and he said, listen, you know. And what you could hear very faintly was all of the whales talking to each other. Right? And you could very faintly hear these whale songs, They're just un, un, unbelievably beautiful thing that was happening. Um, and I, but I sometimes imagine that if I had been able to stay underwater for, for much longer, perhaps days or weeks, that you would get, begin to hear this war that's taking place below the seas. And the reason for that is that you know, one of the main things that this National Underwater Reconnaissance Office does is mapping. Right? And the way they do the mapping is through incredibly powerful sonar devices. So what they do is they create sonic impulses that, have, that are as loud as like 240 decibels. 240 decibels is the same volume as a nuclear explosion. It's one of the loudest things that has ever happened on Earth. It's as loud as a volcano, and there's nothing else comparable to it. Volcanoes, nuclear explosions, and these underwater sonars. So I was imagining hearing the echoes of these unbelievably powerful explosions, really, that signifying this, this underwater war that we have very little um, knowledge of, or even ways to begin thinking about. That's what I got. Thank you, guys. He walked the ribbed sand under the flat keels of whales, under the translucent belly of the snaking current. The tiny shadows of tankers passed over him like snails as he breathed water, a walking fish in its element. He floated in stride, his own shadow over his eyes like a grazing shark through vast meadows of coral, over barnacled cannons whose hulks sprouted anemones like Philocetes' shin. He walked for 300 years in the silken wake like a ribbon of the galleons, their bubbles fading like the transparent men of wars with their lilac dan dangling tendrils bursting like eons, like phosphorus galaxies. He saw the huge cemeteries of bone and the huge crossbows of the rusted anchors and groves of coral with hands as massive as trees, like calcified ferns and the greening gold ingots of bars, whose value had outlasted that of privateers. Then, one afternoon, the ocean lowered and clarified its ceiling, its emerald net, and after three centuries of walking, he thought he could hear the, distance, the distant quarrel of breaker with shore. Then his head broke clear, and his neck. Then he could see his own shadow in the coral grove, in the coral grove, ribbed and rippling with light on the clear sand, as his fins spread their toes and he saw the leaf of his own canoe far out, the life he had left behind, and the white line of surf, low barrel of beef with its dead lantern. The salt glare left him blind for a minute, then the shoreline returned in relief. That was... Um... That was Derek Walcott's um, poem, Omeros, which is a kind of um, uh, a, a revisiting and a rewriting of, uh, of the Odyssey. Um, and uh, it actually has, in a, in a peculiar way, certain resonances with some of the things that Trevor was just saying about the altered topology of the 
undersea world and things that I've been hearing uh, throughout the day. He walks for 3,000 years. So it's a world in which the normal laws of time and space, of duration and height, the normal laws of the human world have been suspended and they've been replaced by uh, a kind of accounting for um, a world that is magical or phantasmagoric or fantastic. Um, and the poem takes, um, the poem is something like an, an inventory of delights. Um, so the poem is something like a, a series of um, compressed enchantments that attempts to distill the kinds of sensory perturbations and the kinds of sensory disturbances that are actually inherent to moving underwater. So they speak to the kind of altered topology that Trevor was talking about, except they're not weaponized. They are kind of demilitarized. So they speak to um, Boris's point about um, a movement between a certain, um, a certain topos of enchantment and a certain topos of utopia that you see in the aquatic. And um, I think what's been compelling about the, the, the last couple of days is how the, the weaponization of the undersea world, the, the militarization, um, the commercialization, the standardization, and the, the division of the sea um, runs in parallel to um, a continuous um, a continuous artistic attempt to envision the sea uh, on behalf of those people who do not have access to it. So the, the very difficulty of accessing the underwater world um, creates a void which is filled with imagination. Um, imagination fills the void and takes on the, the contours the contours of an altered world. So, um, Walcott seems to sub Walcott seems to grasp this and then moves it back in time to the kind of foundational mythology of um, the Odyssey and of Ulysses. But the result is that um, a pre-industrial mythology starts to evoke. Um, the kind of contemporary topological deformations that the undersea water confronts us with. So that it stops being a kind of um, a unique encounter that Ulysses faces and starts to become something like um, an encounter that, that every one of us is obliged to process and metabolize. Um, so that um, the undersea world, which for so long has been paralleled to the world of psychoanalysis um, and the world of the, uh, the Hadean depths and the worlds of the, the pre-conscious, um, this, none of this seems to work anymore. The, the undersea world does not and cannot be analogized to a kind of Freudian schema uh, or a union schema, these 20th century notions don't work anymore. Um, so the, the militarization goes hand in hand with um, possibilities for a kind of a much more elaborated literary reading of the specific kinds of topologies that are unique to the undersea world. So that Walcott's precision, um, his, his precise notation of the fantastic starts to, in a, in a compelling way, starts to map the, the actual topological alteration so that what seems like fantasy stops being fantasy and starts becoming an inventory of the real conditions of, uh, of the underwater world. So um, thank you for reading that and Trevor, thank you for your great presentation. Okay, so um, I'm going to hand over to Inga now.
At first I didn't know what to do. Uh, um, I, I was a bit <coughs> skeptical what actually to do here because um, um, the task of saving the ocean seems to be so obviously uh, urgent. Um, yeah, all these, uh, <coughs> uh, it's, it's the situation, the, the ocean is, uh, is the best example for what happens when you have a <coughs> kind of un, unrestricted capitalism. That's the freedom of the sea, the Mara labor room, uh, and it leads to, yeah, you can, you can just uh, put your rubbish wherever you want, uh, and uh, you, <coughs> you can exploit the ocean now. Whatever extent you like, um, and uh, so so, what what should be the role of of uh, I mean so there seems to be office there's like experts and then there's activists so what what could this be beyond uh, what uh, Greenpeace uh, has been trying and still trying, um, but then I understood that uh, the ambition of uh, of this project um, uh, understood that uh, this project is far more ambitious um, and with this ambition uh, this ambition raises a, a couple of, of problems um, <coughs> which I think is a, is a great thing at least for me because uh, this is what I really love uh, when there are problems um, um, because, uh, yeah, it, it, it started like, uh, about 10 years ago, um, a series of, of books of, of speculative nonfiction uh, called the Solution Series um, that is doing nothing where, where I contribute myself or ask others to contribute and that is not doing nothing that then delivering answers to problems. Um, using this term solution that is, uh, and trying to um, gain it back from, from the technocrats. Uh, and uh, yeah, having a more playful uh, approach to solutions. And um, so, <clears throat> and to, to give you an idea of this approach, um, I, I will talk briefly about, about three problems that, that I encountered in this, uh, uh, oceanic uh, project, um, which is not really, I mean, no one really know. I think we don't really know uh, completely what it is and what it could become, but, but looking at it in the most, uh, uh, yeah, like, like really uh, uh, grasping the whole potential of this project. And the first um, problem is, uh, um, Nabil at some point said, this is a matter of uh, the ocean needs sovereignty. And there was as well this idea of that the pavilion could be a sort of representation of the ocean. Um, and this, of course, leads to the question, who is actually representing the ocean? And uh, in case, um, and this is, I think, in general problem when trying to become an anthropocentric perspective uh, when human beings try to represent uh, non-human beings uh, then this is uh, colonization no? that's the, the typical thing you assume that some people are for whatever reason or some creatures cannot speak for themselves cannot articulate themselves so uh, or others have to interpret them, even just interpret them, then uh, they're, they're others, uh, and they're for whatever reason more qualified. So, uh, then next question, why are they more qualified? Why are some of us particularly qualified? Who are these people? So, again, the question of representation within human beings, unless we find some kind of um, mechanism of, uh, of automatically rep of automatic representation of of, of the sea creatures, um, 
and you could think of all sorts of uh, so is it per se the case that, that people who are most affected by the changes in the ocean are those who are, who are those experts who are destined to, to represent the ocean or is it just the opposite? Is it like when you think this idea of a judge, you, would you rather go for someone who is not, not really that much affected by, by raising sea levels and so on, rather someone coming from the mountain and uh, Francesca herself being, being born in Switzerland. And um, then uh, the next question regarding um, uh, regarding representation, and it, this leads to the second problem, is is that of critique. Uh, when you think of the scenario of having pavilions in Venice, then usually, uh, uh, at least nowadays, uh, we would all agree that this like national pavilions only make sense when there is a possibility within this pavilion to criticize the nation and. Uh, um, so I, I know it from like the German pavilion, it's an extreme case as it's a fascist building. So a lot of contributions have been criticizing the architecture of this building and so on. So what about, and this leads to, uh, to the second problem and we, we saw it in the images, uh, dark, dark ecology, um, the, the bad sides of the ocean because uh, as again, there was, there was this idea. Uh, yeah, you, you could. Uh, we we tend to as 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 a means to to um, to save the ocean, to to romanticize it, to say it's it's this like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. But uh, of course, there is as well a lot of of violence, of cruelty, of of suffering. So and now. You imagine a, a scenario, not not probably not that far in the future, where uh, genetic engineering is doing fast progress, and imagine um, we we become capable of of reducing the suffering of human beings, maybe uh, dis, uh, uh, abolishing it completely. What do we de then do with the ocean? Do we say no? The ocean has to stay as a kind of uh, authentic, natural thing, even though there's a lot of suffering. Again, is this not, you know, this kind of, um, it's a catch-22, you know, one way or the other, you will always be paternalistic. One way saying, no, no, nature has to stay as it is, while we uh, uh, humans are uh, undergoing drastic change. And the other one as well, knowing what is best for those creatures. and. Um, we, we uh, I, I think that we really have no idea what, what suffering actually is and how much different kinds of creatures uh, suffer. We do this, our ideas that we have about, um, I, I, have, I, have, I have all these kind of prejudices and we have been talking about it during these days, like you assume, I assume that a pig is suffering more than a cow because a cow is kind of, seems to be more, Dump while 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 a pig a pig is screaming and the pig anticipates when it's uh, gonna get killed and so on. But you know we we don't really understand even what consciousness is and so I don't know maybe a jellyfish is suffering more than us. You know we have no idea. It's just not expressing it. Um, and uh, so. The third problem then is uh, so so you could, uh, um, is, uh, um, for me is this idea of of engagement. I this is one of the words I I, I heard many many times uh, the last days was that how great it is to engage with the ocean and uh, and some here there, there was. A, a bit of a division between those who actually had been on an expedition and who made these experiences and the others. And the others almost felt like, uh, Coach said um, at some point, I feel like an outsider here. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't 
done these experiences. So, so what am I even doing here? But, <clears throat> and so that's, that's this problem of how, of course you can say it's just a matter of communication and this is exactly what, uh, what art is for, that art is enabling uh, all the, the people who haven't done these expeditions to, uh, to as well um, grasp these kind of um, experiences. Uh, this kind of engagement and through that as well be activated in, in sensing how important it is to, to take care of the oceans. Um, but it's not, you know, doing these expeditions and I mean uh, seeing corals and their beauty and so on, it's not like going to, to Mars or to, to the moon. It's something that theoretically like everyone on earth could do, you know, we could all kind of, we could even devil, we could uh, think of developing certain rituals, how to, um, how to, how to encounter the, the ocean in a way that is, um, uh, uh, that is um, <coughs> raising our empathy for it. Um, and which, which made me think of, of one in, in this solution series, the, the mo most recent book I did is, uh, is called uh, Complete Love. Uh, gone again? No. Yes, now it's back again. Um, um, <clears throat> and this book is envisioning something that then later on um, kind of it's a, it's a sort of prequel to something that I now envision as an army of love. And this, this army of love tries to give uh, love to people a uh, couple of people we have we have really trying to so um, the, the the general assumption is um, even even in a, in a otherwise completely just society in a communist society some some people would be privileged because they they would be more attractive than others they would get more love than the others so um, how can you redistribute love um, how can you uh, start loving people and not just in a platonic charity way but in an essential way that in the first place you didn't find attractive at all. Um, so uh, I, I started with a group of people, of performers, of artists, um, of activists, uh, disabled activists and so on um, to, to think of, of routines that could, could enable us to, to give love in, in this kind of control, controlled way. And you could think of, of, of adapting this to um, to the ocean, to sea creatures. Yeah? How actually, and of course you could say, I don't know if uh, probably the coral, uh, the jellyfish, or the fish doesn't doesn't even that it doesn't even realize that I am giving this love. But what we realized very soon uh, with this project, the Army of Love, is that it's actually highly attractive for people to be in the position of the one... No, okay. Uh, that it's very attractive for people to give love. Um, because it's a very controlled thing and um, uh, have this kind of, of setting and, and, and enabling yourself so not... <clears throat> uh, not, not see yourself as, as, as a victim of, of, of yeah, not being, being lovesick and so on and so on. So um, you, you could think of a way of adapting it to, to the ocean and uh, even if, you know, the, the point there would be not so much about making these creatures of the ocean realize that we really love them and that we really care, but um, to, uh, uh, it's about that we ourselves feel it, no? That we, uh, uh, it's the same as when you hug a tree. Uh, it's the, the tree won't probably won't feel anything, but but you feel better. You have this. You have given love. Um, um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, there's that. I, I think the last days there was something in in the air, and uh, so you have to kind of reinvent tree hugging, and maybe even do invent something that is goes far beyond it, and so much more. 
at yeah, sea hugging that is much more interesting, that is much more intriguing uh, than that. And then at the same time, you, you soon might come up with a logistic problem. Imagine it becomes so attractive to do this kind of, let's call it sea hugging, um, that uh, like 7 billion people on earth want to do it. And uh, so, could we think you, you would suddenly be confronted with a completely new kind of tourism? And this is something you have to be aware of when you talk to us like this, like, I mean, like being completely um, mesmerized by your experiences in the ocean and uh, divers are like this and so on, but you, you're going to do it in an even more casual way than, than a, a whole new demand of tourism could, could, uh, could develop out of this. And then you would have to think, oh, do we actually have to do, make like, uh, routines of, of, of virtual sea hugging as well. Can we do sea hugging as well, like here, right here on the meadow? Yeah, rituals, exactly. Could be, could be lots of rituals and, uh, and ceremonies and, um, yeah, that's... Well, we can, of course, yeah. We still have some time. Uh, but, uh, that's uh, so I'm, I'm quiet now. Can I ask you a question? No, okay. we need questions. So um, this might sound really naive, but uh, you said uh, we. I mean, you're talking about love. So how can we love? Because you said we have no understanding of suffering, which I agree with. So if uh, we have no understanding of suffering, what is it to have an understanding of uh, suffering? But love is not only about uh, realizing that someone else is suffering and then pitying that, that yeah, creature. Right. Not at all. Not at all. And uh, of course we have ideas and, and when you see... Uh, and something in that respect I think that could as well be challenging is not only to hug of and, and this kind of... Uh, the beautiful creatures not just the turtles and the dolphins, and I mean, there's as well uh, fishes that look really disgusting and muddy, and uh, yeah, and uh, and um, <clears throat> this then could lead you as well back to uh, to um, as a sort of exercise then to this army of love with other humans. You know, you could. Uh, the nice thing about, about uh, sea creatures is that we do not really know that they are more like a black box and <coughs> that they are so beyond the uncanny valley that even like a muddy fish is not so much a problem to, to develop love maybe <coughs> than, um, than with, with a lot of human beings. But, but it could be a first step. But uh, how do we invent a sensitivity to suffering that negates our necessity to sense? Okay. The microphone is not cheap. Uh, let it be a rhetoric question. I have a question for the men with the diving communication cables. <laughs> Trevor? Yeah. Uh, the ICBP is uh, one of these uh, organizations which is kind of private and on employers. And they are also observers of the International Space Authority. But uh, I, uh, we have a memor memorandum of understanding and memorandum of working. And they, uh, they are strongly opposed to disclose the uh, geographic uh, coordinates of the cables uh -huh. because they are private. Now, my question is, can you send me, or do you have the <laughs> coordinates yes. of those cables and the heading? This is a deal. And the heading of those cables, because I want to have them. And I do have them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Trevor, do it. <laughs> no, the, the trick is not figuring out where they are. You can usually find those from nautical charts. I think the thing that takes the extra work is identifying what is what. You know, I think that's that's where some of the work is, and then also identifying places where you can see them because mostly they're, you know, even on the bottom of the ocean, they're covered in sediment and things like that. So you 
defined reef systems and things like that that they would emerge from. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you can get them from nautical charts that are freely available from NOAA. Um, the exception to that is overseas nautical charts that are published in the U.S. fall under a different authority. They're actually published by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which is an intelligence agency. And there's some maps that are in this weird gray zone that I haven't figured out how to get them, particularly in the Middle East, like maps around Djibouti, um, Straits of Oman, places like that. They're very cagey about even though they're theoretically public documents. But you can get other ones from the um, British Navy. Um, you know, there's a lot of different countries that publish these kind of nautical charts. And for the most part, they're indicated. They're also indicated on a lot of onboard GPS navigational systems, like in the digital format that a lot of sea captains use. That there's an option to show them, I think. And that's pretty accurate. The, the, the trick is just to try to figure out what, what exactly it is that you're looking at. Um, I'm sorry to keep going, but uh, did you ever cross a, a, a power channel? A power, a power, a power cable, excuse me. Not no, well, the way that they're set up is that they are also power cables. So the power for the communication cable goes through the cable itself. So there's a, like 12,000 volts that go through those things. Well, I'm kind of, kind of confused. I have one, one of communication cable in my office, and, and it's very thin. Yeah. But the power cables are quite thick. Oh, you mean power cables just like regular energy? energy. Oh, so not for the cable specifically? Yeah. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, I would encourage you to try to find someone else because I want to see where they are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mic. That's a commission. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I'm in the middle. Oh, he can't stand up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. It's gone. Inko. Trevor, yo. Yes. Can I respond to you oh, in, in just a bit because uh, we could have a long and engaging First of all, thank you for bringing up three programs. Because um, a lot of, um, I suppose, what of many ideas that are coagulating around this idea and this uh, this uh, project is are are happening in such a speed that it is critical to have somebody to stop you for a second and say, like, like, wait a minute, have you thought about this? And actually having traveled extensively around um, the Pacific, I'm pretty aware of the impact of colonization. Um, I've also heard the word imperialism today a couple of times. And I, I don't know, these seem to be very broad strokes, you know, in, in a sense that um, the points that you raise are extremely important, and I'm taking, I take it on board immediately, and I'm excited to hear about to hear them and your views on it. Um, speaking on behalf of the oceans is a question that I've asked myself for a long time: whether or not any cultural institution can presume to do that. But as you said, you know, the the idea of a national pavilion is often to critique its own country. And um, there's plenty in the oceans to critique. And um, actually, my question at the beginning of this seminar was, how much of you know we don't want we don't want to be the atom glorification of the beautiful planet. At the same time, we don't want to be news broadcasters of, of um, you know dream peace mission, and uh, therefore flipping into the activist. Uh, and so where, where, how does art in all those different pavilions, all the different nationalities, except for the, I think, Nigerians who were trying to hire Chinese artists to fund their pavilion last year. You know, there is a lot uh, of mischief that goes on in Venice as well, so which we obviously don't want to participate in either. But I think that carrying many of the issues that we shared over the last few days with some of the experts and I really I stayed up until 3 30 in the morning with Dalvor Rivas um, asking him also for a hypothetical law of the oceans if what if you know I think 
hypothesis is a really interesting way forward. And I don't think it implies colonization. I think it implies suggesting. It implies, um, you know, if you take an image like you've seen of Anutia, you know, who are we to say, you know, much about that other than to expose what is now being concealed and overlooked uh, until the North Korean despot starts, you know, testing nuclear again. I, I actually, until very recently, I think nuclear testing was off people's radar completely. Um, and it is still a very huge issue uh, for, for, for a French Polynesian. And I think that I would love to run through all of the points that you bring up, but I think that your, the idea of just loving and, and the fact that we need to find an empathy, I think maybe the role that we have and the question that I had to everybody at the beginning of this is how do we reflect, provoke, um, and suggest ways forward? And the interesting conversations I've had, I've been with scientists and also politicians and activists and people who are kind of stuck with the way they represent themselves or the way that their, their, their discipline limits their ability to speak to the outside world. And how much of that and why can't art perform the function of not translating this but offering some creative thinking towards how to express themselves differently. I mean, I just, I, I love the idea that we are love, in love with the environment, and I'm sorry that people feel left out of those expeditions, but we challenge those who come with us, because we realize we're a very privileged few, um, to, in their work and through their work, and through the knowledge production, because ultimately we're not the, the expeditions, to be clear, were, were initiated as knowledge production rather than producing art. And it was only recently with this, you know, whether or right, the pavilion is the correct way forward um, is a question I still have um, to myself and to others, to all of you. But the pavilion is an opportunity to, as you say, criticize one's own nation, if you want, and offer an insight into that from the inside. And I think this is a valid opportunity, but as you say, maybe it is opportunist and, and it is a project that, that still can be heavily questioned and must be heavily questioned. And I thank you for bringing the problems up, but I'm, I'm sure that we can negotiate those. Um, can I just, Ingo, is going to respond, but I just asked him if I could say one thing. Um, because otherwise it'll go from my head because I smoked a joint. <laughs> and um, it was given to me from, from somewhere over that side. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think um, I kept thinking about this term decolonization as you were speaking because I think the point of loving now has to be related to decolonization. And that means understanding the position of negation and the alien. So to say, you know, I, we weren't on the boat is to occupy that state of negation as an important critical state. But also I think that the idea of decolonization involves listening to the undying voices of decolonizing bodies who have always been practicing decolonization ever since the beginning of capitalism. And for me, a space of a pavilion that represents the oceans, which are the most diverse, you can, I mean, there's so many metaphors for what that space of the ocean represents, and it's mirrored in human society now because of its imminent death. And that sense that decolonization and that imminent threat but linked to listening to the histories of practices of remaining decolonized. This, for me, is what a pavilion can be. You know, 
that's the only thing it can be because there are so many people thinking about how to create new languages now. But you're responding on a, as a terrestrial person, you know, and um, the history of those, these oceans and the, the very small populations, and particularly in the, in the Pacific, as we said the small island states, but great ocean countries, um, is not exclusively a question of a decolonization. It really, um, I don't think the whales feel colonized, they feel maybe persecuted. <laughs> I think this is a real social issue of, of mankind. It's not so much the only thing what uh, an ocean pavilion can represent. I don't agree with you at all. Um, what is, uh, when, when I was speaking about problems, it was, I could have as well said dimensions of the project and, and uh, this is just something where I think when you encounter, when you are reaching that point where these problems become like manifest, then, then I think this is a, would be the greatest sign because it means that, that this thing is becoming really big. And I, I know it my, my, myself from, from this Army of Love thing, which is, I'm a writer, so, uh, and then st I, I started just <coughs> in two times two encounters with people and, uh, and it gains dynamic. People are really excited, they want this to happen. And the moment then you, s you start thinking, well, but what, what is this actually? What kind of organization is this? Is this a movement? Is this an organization? Then does it need a structure? Uh, do we need certain rules? And so on and so on and so on. Um, and so it, it, uh, it, it, I didn't mean this like as a, as a critique at this point, just as, you know, yeah, dimensions. And um, I, I, I didn't, f I, it wasn't horrible to be an outsider with this expedition. It's just, I'm just saying this is an experience and it felt as well completely fine. And there were moments as well uh, uh, when there was this miming. I, I think this is so so nice and lovely, and it reminded me of a, of a group performance I saw a couple of months ago in Mexico City by Eduardo Navarro, and it was eighty um, volunteers who were uh, all together like enacting uh, the movements of an octopus uh, in in a park, and it was so uh, amazing. It was. Yes. <laughs> Can I tell? No. I think the next one should just have a loud voice. <laughs> yeah. Maybe? Uh, I, I, I will stand up. I, I think I, I it works again. You go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I think I want to no, that's okay. I I want to I, I want to make a, a contextual contextual uh, statement. And based on what uh, Chus Martinez mentioned when she was speaking about it. That at the begin beginning, I have a hard time to follow because she was using so many words in English that I have to kind of translate. But <coughs> if I am in a raft in the middle of the ocean, I have no water to drink. So I will die because I have no, no fresh water to drink. But if I do an enema <coughs> of seawater, I can survive. Everybody know what an enema is, right? <laughs> Something to put in your ass. And if I put sea water in my ass, I can survive. I don't need to love the ocean. I, I am here because of the ocean. I just need to protect it. But I have a problem with that. I don't think that we need to protect it. I think that, that we need really to love it. 
And I think that we need to love it in ways that you can even extend this love to new rituals. And that's the problem with us, that we only rationalize the idea. And protecting, it means to disentangle the action from the feeling. And, uh, well, we, you know, we have been in institutional critique criticizing, for example, how we marry or the institution of marriage, but no, not if we should marry married somehow different. So the idea of imagining new rituals for people at work, in their offices, in the many thousands of cities of the planet loving the ocean is completely appealing to me. It's so stupid that it's fantastic. So imagine that 15 minutes a day, um, as much as people used to do yoga or Pilates or whatever therapy that actually, I think I am completely a believer that we are at the beautiful end of psychoanalysis. And the psychoanalysis, which is an etymological therapy, is ending by a much more behavioral one. I'm already which is the many things that are happening. So the love, the ritual, the new rituals of the ocean, they're great. No, it's only because you're Chilean. <laughs> we, see, we see all these images here. You know? These images, so many of them are this like, like longing for the ocean, to somehow unite with the ocean. Uh, there were these like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we just have to stop. Who would like to speak? Welcome to us. <laughs> this is the love boat. Yeah, 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 this is the love boat. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not an artist and I'm, I'm not a thinker. But I really, really like the concept of uh, sea hugging. Very, very much. But the thing is that when you hug a tree, each individual can hug a tree. But what we want, we, what we want to see is humanity hugging the ocean. The whole humanity. And that, I think that artists like you are can do it way more easily than politics or scientists. So once again, I mean, that's a call I'm doing. You artists can give another dimension to humanity to use the ocean. Yes, to use the ocean. And the ocean can be used to erase all the, the bad thing that humanity did to the land, all, the, all the, the, the messed up things that we did to Earth, we can do something about the ocean, which is more or less the only clean thing that we have on our, on our planet. So that's why the ocean needs a hug, a hug for you, from you, humanity, to for, so humanity is forgiven for what it had at the, the beginning. We had something very pure, and we have only the ocean left. So thank you for this image of uh, giving uh, the, the sea hug. I, I really like it. Thank you.